Before starting off, I want to acknowledge a video with a similar premise that I think is very much worth watching. Pixel a Day's In Defense of Walking Simulators discusses a lot of the same games I'm about to and focuses on much of the same issues this video does, albeit in a more intelligent and coherent manner. I first stumbled upon Pixel a Day's video right before scripting this one, and although these essays are similar in some ways, they do have some key differences. She focused more on walking simulators as a whole, whereas I will discuss what, in my opinion, makes some work and why others fail to engage. I wanted to preface the video with this because, one, it's a great video and I think you should watch it, and two, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least mention it ahead of time. Although her video wasn't the inspiration for this one, it did make me reevaluate the topic at hand and consider things I didn't initially. With all that being said, let's get into... Many discussions surrounding walking simulators argue whether or not they should be considered games at all. More often than not, I find the discourse pertaining to this usually devolves into hyper-opinionated nonsense. My opinion on walking simulators, if I had to talk about them as a whole, is that they're a net positive for the medium. Oftentimes, a game's emotional core can be obstructed by moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. What I mean by this is that sometimes I can't be bothered to care about the story or characters because what's more present and important is my survival. I don't want to die, not because I don't want to see my character get murked, but because I don't want to be forced to reload a checkpoint and go through an area again. I wouldn't say that it necessarily breaks immersion, but being faced with a loading screen upon death is a good reminder of a game's artificiality. Some games get around this by recontextualizing fail states entirely. Quantic Dreams games come to mind. Instead of simply failing to rescue this girl and being sent back to a checkpoint, Detroit Become Human allows you to fail and move on, incorporating your failings into the plot. This may not be a perfect metaphor, but picture it like this. You're taking a test in school and you knew you kind of blew it, but you go to hand in your exam to the teacher anyway. If your teacher is, let's say, Quake, they'll tell you to go back and correct your mistakes and won't allow you to turn in your paper until you've gotten every answer right. If your teacher is Detroit Become Human, they'll accept your exam no matter how well or poorly you might have done on it. Of course, not every game can be as expansive as Detroit, and not every game needs to be like Quake, but you get what I'm saying. Walking simulators cheat and remove fail states entirely. I personally enjoy this, as the lack of traditional gamey mechanics allow me to better and more easily connect with characters in the world. That's not to say that ordinary game mechanics are always a detriment, but again, it's hard for me to care about the story when it and the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay are so divorced from one another. Walking simulators, for the most part, are better off without traditional mechanics anyway. Although the genre status as legitimate games is solidified for me, others argue there are no more games than a DVD menu would be. There's always been the argument that walking sims are needlessly reductive and only incorporate the bare minimum level of interactivity. And for some of them, yeah, I don't really have a counter. More often than not, however, this criticism neglects to mention that exploration, in and of itself, is a mechanic. I've always disliked the notion that difficulty, not pure interactivity, is what sets games apart from other mediums. Of course, they usually go hand in hand, but I don't think that any sort of difficulty or challenge being removed from the equation means that something isn't a game. A game not implementing a failure state, no matter how rigid or flexible, doesn't lessen its value or status as a game. Walking Simulator is a misnomer anyway. If I were to call any one game a walking simulator, I'd name Quop. None of the games I'm about to discuss have failure states. It wouldn't make sense in many of these instances anyway, since their gameplay isn't predicated on challenge. Firewatch takes exploration as a mechanic to its logical extreme. It's probably the most gamey out of all the games I'll talk about. For the uninitiated, you're a Firewatch. You wander around the woods and solve problems, whether that be telling off teenage girls for setting off fireworks, investigating cut power lines, or spelunking. An initial look at the map may be daunting, but upon realizing that it's segmented by caves and shale slides, you'll likely grow familiar with it rather quickly. For all intents and purposes, this is an open world. Some light puzzle solving is required to traverse the world, and the only way the game highlights objectives and provides waypoints is through an actual map. Firewatch, above almost any other walking sim, I would say requires the most player agency. Not that other walking sims lack that requirement, just that in it, you'll be made to revisit locations occasionally and are incentivized to memorize the park and its landmarks. There's little to no hand-holding, and the few times you can receive help, it's done through Delilah, the player character's boss over the radio, so it feels more natural and less like an unwanted, overtly gamey tutorial. Hey, I'm back near that big rock outcropping, but not sure how to get back. I'd head west, back towards the lake, and then turn north towards the canyon. Although I overall like the world's design, it can be slightly irksome when the only thing preventing you from progressing the story is an obscured clearing in the brush that's extremely difficult to notice under normal circumstances. Coming back to Delilah, though, the game benefits greatly from her presence. 
Although you're effectively alone for the majority of the game, having Delilah basically always on the radio means that events that might not normally be noteworthy are lended a greater importance, with Delilah providing context and investment from the player. If Delilah didn't exist and Henry was doing everything he does of his own volition, then the game wouldn't be half as interesting or engaging, at least in my eyes. I mean, the central mystery would probably be enough on its own, but without Delilah communicating with us throughout, the first half of the game would be a slog. The ways in which the player can interact with Delilah are simple but effective. It's an easy way to get the player to care about Delilah, and thankfully Campo Santo understood that completely. If Delilah's delivering an exposition dump, it still feels genuine, like it's something she'd actually do and say, like it's something a real person would actually say, unlike the narration in Dear Esther. Dear Esther, I think, has the bones of something greater buried somewhere underneath its surface. Underneath the extremely overwrought and flowery narration and the completely unnecessary ambiguity lended to every event mentioned throughout, I think that there's a good, or at the very least interesting, game. Somewhere. Though my reading could be overly generous. Dear Esther, I would say, definitively requires the least player agency out of all the games featured in this video, but more on that later. Starting off with some positives, the game is downright beautiful. My favorite sort of days are of the gray, lifeless, chilly, late fall to early spring variety, and Dear Esther's Island feels like it caters specifically to that. The caves especially are extremely striking. The narration, for how absurd the writing is, is at least performed well. The music is another great aspect. Tracks range from haunting, to bittersweet, to downright sad, and it often sets a great tone. That's good, since tone is about all the gameplay offers. Now listen, I don't think a game need be anything besides interactive. Dear Esther is interactive. If it didn't pointlessly obscure and distort its plot and recite such obtuse exposition, I might enjoy it more than I do. Unfortunately, Dear Esther is of a mind that making things extremely vague makes it seem smarter than it is. Likely, you'll be confused as to who you're even playing as when the game starts. I thought I was playing as the eponymous Esther initially, and didn't figure out until about three-fourths of the way through that that wasn't the case. The narration is horribly pretentious. It feels like something a self-indulgent 14-year-old would write. In other words, it feels like something I would have written when I was 14. The prose is obnoxious, and almost none of it feels genuine. We are not like Lot's wife, you and I. We feel no particular need to turn back. There's nothing to be seen if we did. No tired old man parting the cliffs with his arms. No gifts or Bibles laid out on the sand for the taking. No tides turning or the shrieking gulls overhead. The bones of the hermit are no longer laid out for the taking. I have stolen them away to the guts of this island, where the passages all run to black, and where we can light each other's faces by their strange luminescence. Dear Esther doesn't believe in just using the right words, it believes in using as many words as possible. Adding to this, the narration is randomized, so you'll never hear the narrator's interjections in the same order twice. I can derive no purpose from this. If you're paying attention, the entire story will be revealed with basically one offhand comment. I had kidney stones and you visited me in the hospital. After the operation, when I was still half submerged in anesthetic, your outline and your speech both blurred. Now my stones have grown into an island and made their escape, and you have been rendered opaque by the car of a drunk. There's also flavor text to provide some backstory to the island and its past inhabitants. This is also pointless, as these characters have no impact on the plot and only serve to confuse the player. I thought I was piecing it all together until I heard the narrator bring up Jakobsen and wondered who the fuck that is and how he's relevant to the story. He's not. He was a shepherd who lived on the island in the 1700s. I'm not sure why the narrator talks about him when he's on the verge of suicide due to the loss of his wife. It feels like Jakobsen should be the last thing on his mind, but whatever. I'm getting off track, but the reason I compared Dear Esther to Firewatch is that the dialogue and interactions between the characters in Firewatch feel authentic. There's something to be said for presenting a story in the present tense as well. Not that all stories benefit from this, but I would say that Firewatch does. You're exploring a wide map and conversing with a woman the protagonist is romantically linked to. Dear Esther, although not a perfect match, is kinda the same thing if you're super reductive. You're wandering a large map and speaking at a woman the protagonist was romantically linked to. The reason that it works in Firewatch, past or present tense aside, is that Delilah is given a ton of characterization and the player has a stake in their relationship. You never meet Delilah, but she has a voice and a personality. She feels real, and not just because you directly interact with her. Esther is granted no characterization at all. She's dead, I understand, but the narrator never really takes the time to delve into who Esther was or why we should care about her. She exists as a name and that's it. It also doesn't help that the gameplay and story in Dear Esther are almost completely incongruous.
In Firewatch, the story is about Henry's escapism and the plot is about espionage, but the player is present for it and experiences everything as Henry does. At the end of Dear Esther, the narrator throws himself off a radio tower to his demise, and you think it'd be playable like everything preceding it, but no. For some reason, the game takes control away from the player at the point where it'd be most impactful to have it. While I've been critiquing Dear Esther's approach to its story, I've probably made it sound as though a past tense retelling in this genre couldn't work, but that assertion couldn't be further from the truth. Gone Home works better than Dear Esther because 1. Discovery is player-driven. When you uncover new pieces of lore in Gone Home, it's not because you just happen to stand in a particular place. It's because you found a relevant piece of information or an object directly relating to the story being told. 2. The Greenbrier family is given loads of characterization, through notes left behind, books, cassette tapes, journals, and more. 3. We actually get to hear from Sam, the main character of the story being uncovered. In Dear Esther, Esther is never once heard from. 4. This one is more personal preference, but Gone Home is a lot more comfortable in being contemporary. Dear Esther kinda half-asses it, and until it's revealed that Esther died in a car crash, you could be mistaken for thinking the story takes place in the early 1900s. Gone Home is easily one of my favorites in the walking sim genre. The response it received upon release was equal parts polarizing, and to me, disconcerting. It was one of the first times the hardcore gaming audience felt they had to reevaluate or at least reconsider what defined a traditional game. It feels now like trying to establish the difference between a book and a comic book or graphic novel. I mean, this isn't not a book, but it's not a book in the completely traditional sense. If anything, I would equate walking sims to conventional novels and normal games to comic books. Walking sims are usually more meditative and minimalist, in a way that quote-unquote regular games aren't. This isn't meant to be some indictment or scathing attack on traditional game design, just that it's always been that walking simulators feel more akin to the structure and pacing of novels, and more normal games tend to indulge in more frills and thrills. I also don't intend for this to sound as though it's uniform. Not everything relating to the topic of game design is black and white, fucking obviously. And there are plenty of games that explore a sort of middle ground between the two. Maybe I'm just constructing a false dichotomy. If anything I'm saying makes any sense, then leave a comment. Gone Home works because it's player-driven. In Dear Esther, you're given almost no agency. The path forward is basically always obvious, and you never uncover anything independent of the narrator. The only objective is to move from one place to another, and beyond sightseeing, there's not much to do. Gone Home, however, trusts the player to do some detective work. It's never very difficult, but the sense that you're unearthing secrets and piecing together events is excellent, largely because that's actually what you're doing. If you're confused playing Gone Home, it's because you're not paying attention. If you're confused playing Dear Esther, well, it'd be hard to blame you. I was too. It seems almost as though it's the game's sole intent. I talked about how Dear Esther only really provides tone through its gameplay, meaning that there's a general mood that's expressed, but not much else. Gone Home provides tone and texture, meaning that, in addition to the general ambiance, the world feels tangible. Being able to hold, rotate, and gawk at almost every item in the world helps that sense of tangibility greatly. Dear Esther's Island feels like a set. A beautiful and elaborate set, but just a set. Gone Home's residence feels like a truly lived-in place. Even without reading notes or listening to Sam's narration, you get a great sense of who these people were. You learn gradually what motivated them, their hobbies and interests, their fears, their mundane issues, and more. Gone Home's home lends characterization through environmental storytelling. Dear Esther's Island does not. There's also something to be said for setting your walking sim in an at least semi-ordinary or relatable environment. The events of Gone Home's story hit with more impact because it feels more present and, for lack of a better term, real. You've likely lived in a house and had a family, and that setting immediately makes it feel more earnest than Dear Esther. Though, just because your walking sim takes place in an everyday setting doesn't mean that its story necessarily has to be grounded. The Stanley Parable, not interested in telling a straightforward narrative like the games we've gone over, focuses on celebrating player choice. It's commendable, I think, to make a game which so, I guess obviously, highlights the choices we can make in a branching narrative. I think it's a good premise, and games are obviously fertile ground for exploring the concept, but in execution it kind of falls apart for me. I think, granted its limitations, The Stanley Parable does as good of a job as it can relaying its core themes and ideas. The problem, for me, is that it suffers heavily from diminishing returns. I think Matthew Matosis does a good job explaining what I mean. If I randomly told you a hundred knock-knock jokes over the course of a year, you might find many of them to be funny. But if I sat you down and said, I'm going to start telling you knock-knock jokes now, 
and then proceeded to tell you a hundred knock-knock jokes in a row, the effect would be very different. At some point it becomes irrelevant how good those jokes are individually, their effectiveness will be diminished just by their proximity to one another. What this means is that, essentially, all of the jokes and gags being in such close proximity to one another, and being expected every time, results in the game feeling tired and boring before long, at least for me. A lot of gags ending with the player standing in place while almost nothing happens doesn't help either. That's not to say that the jokes aren't amusing on their own or that the narration is bad, just that, like, I get it. Before long, you get it. If I'm always anticipating subversion, then the subversions lose their effect. It also makes me roll my eyes with sequences like this. At first, Stanley assumed he'd broken the map, until he heard this narration and realized it was part of the game's design all along. He then praised the game for its insightful and witty commentary into the nature of video game structure and its examination of structural narrative tropes. The game pats itself on the back for its insightful and witty commentary that isn't very insightful or profound at all. This is a fake glitch. I'm not sure what commentary the game thinks it's espousing, but I don't find this sequence valuable. Glitches happen sometimes, but this one is intentional. So what? Left. No! Why did you do that? Quickly, hurry is behave exactly as Stanley would. That means choosing responsibly and always putting the story first. Most of the rest of the game feels like, oh, you thought this? Well, actually, and I don't usually find it as clever as the game does. The central mechanic of choice is metatextual, of course, and I think that's a concept worth exploring. Fortunately, it's been done in games that aren't so up their own asses. The Stanley Parable, to me, doesn't say anything revelatory about games, game structure, design, developers, or how we engage with games. I appreciate that it exists, but I can't really say it maximizes its concept's potential. But I also can't say it doesn't. Outside of a choose-your-own-adventure book, this type of experience is only really possible in a game. Commenting on the Stanley Parable's status as a game, I find that people are usually far more comfortable calling the Stanley Parable a game than something like Gone Home or Dear Esther. Likely, this is because the Stanley Parable features explicit choice and fail states. It seems to me that unless a game has an explicitly stated central mechanic, critics and audiences are likely to be far less lenient when deciding what they consider them to be. What's to say that Gone Home's central mechanic isn't exploration? It's mentioned directly on its Steam store page, but I've seldom seen it brought up in discussions. At best, people argue against walking sims being games because they believe that games must feature either challenge, explicit mechanics, or fail states. I disagree with those assertions, but I wouldn't say their argument is in bad faith. At worst, though, people argue against them because they perceive a lack of interactivity. I'm sorry, but this is interactivity. Baseline, but I'm controlling a thing on screen throughout a physical world and manipulating pixels. Regardless, I think both arguments are constraining. Going back to the traditional book versus graphic novel debate, you wouldn't call this a not book. They use somewhat similar, but also radically different methods of conveying ideas in two comparable mediums. Would you not call Toy Story a film just because it wasn't filmed and produced by conventional methods? Of course, none of these analogies are perfect, and I probably sound like a self-indulgent 14-year-old, but I hope I'm making some sense. These aren't strictly games in the traditional sense, they're a different type of game. Instead of the industry having an identity crisis over these games, we should have just classified them as narrative-driven and moved on. Imposing that a game must feature challenge or a fail state of some sort is incredibly limiting on the medium, at least in my eyes. In short, The Stanley Parable is a good concept with so-so execution. A game that I think does a better job exploring game design and how people engage with games and their creators through being a walking sim is... Hi there. Thank you very much for playing The Beginner's Guide. The Beginner's Guide, developed by the same guy who made the Stanley Parable, explores the games made by the fictional Coda, the developer's once friend. The Beginner's Guide does a better job than the Stanley Parable did exploring games and their design because it isn't interested in trying to be clever just for the sake of being clever. The Beginner's Guide guides you through multiple games with varying degrees of, well, coherence in an effort to show the different design philosophies and methodologies Coda displayed in his works. It comments on the parasocial relationships that can arise between creators and consumers, it does all of this through a tightly scripted linear narrative through Coda's games through this game. Its commentary on the nature of video games is much less self-congratulatory than the Stanley Parable and, as a result, is much more intelligent. As an example, take the fake glitch from the Stanley Parable and compare it against the fake glitch sequence in the Beginner's Guide. The Stanley Parable doesn't comment on how glitches can be detrimental to a player's immersion and experience, or explore why some players might exploit them. It just goes, look, an intentional bug. Isn't this so wacky? It says nothing of value. The Beginner's Guide, instead, presents the glitch as unintentional within the game's own context. Well, the narrator says it's probably unintentional anyway. 
The narrator tries to make sense of what he thinks Coda might have been trying to convey with this. Knowing Coda, though, there's almost no chance this glitch was unintended. The narrator inserts what he thinks Coda likely intended to happen as well, kind of telling on himself that he has an unhealthy obsession with twisting and distorting Coda's works into something more easily understandable for himself. With a short sequence, the beginner's guide explores how glitches can sometimes be implemented knowingly to spur discussion. It comments on how some people will bend over backwards to disregard what they perceive as a flaw to help reinforce their own headcanon. It's informative in a way that the Stanley Parable never was while discussing the topic. The Beginner's Guide relies heavily on an unreliable narrator, and to an extent, so does the Stanley Parable. In the Stanley Parable, though, you kind of have to make the narrator unreliable. He is reliable and truthful until you become defiant, and while it's fun on your first playthrough, it, like I said before, suffers from diminishing returns. The Beginner's Guide's unreliable narrator is much more effective for me because he's an actual narrator, not a commentator. In the Stanley Parable, all it takes is one disobeyed order and then comedy ostensibly ensues and you more or less get the point of the game. The Beginner's Guide isn't so obvious. I never think back on the Stanley Parable because there's nothing to think back on. Anything the game wants me to consider, it will divulge in full. The Beginner's Guide is more effective for me in getting me to reconsider game design, interpreting a game's message, and thinking on parasocial relationships because it's not just face value, no room for subtext, declaring things. I mean, don't get me wrong, I know the Stanley Parable is likely not trying to be a slow burn like the Beginner's Guide, but still. Both games are incredibly novel, but the Beginner's Guide works for me because it's more committed to a single overarching idea, that being exploring Coda's games. It takes itself far more seriously than The Stanley Parable and I think massively benefits from being a linear, predetermined story. In The Stanley Parable, since the game makes no commitment to being grounded or real at all, all of its subversions quickly became expected and, not long after that, boring. There are no rules, narratively, in The Stanley Parable and I think that works for and against it. The rules imposed upon the beginner's guide by just trying to tell a story about games and people through games and people serve to make its metatextual story beats land with more impact. If you've taken anything positive away from this video in regards to how you view walking sims, then I've accomplished what I set out to do. If you still don't care for walking sims, then feel free to leave a dislike. I realize that this video would have been more relevant in like 2014 when all of this was still a hot button issue, but screw it. I wanted to talk about it and now I have. Throughout this video and everywhere else, these games are called walking simulators, and I mentioned briefly in the beginning that it's probably not what we should call them. Though, despite how inadequate I find the term to be when it comes to actually describing these games, it's transformed from an insulting dismissal to a genuinely helpful tag. It's too late to whine about the name, but hopefully people can start to appreciate walking sims for what they offer rather than deride them for what they lack. It, like a lot of things, is all about perspective. If you were to go into Gone Home expecting heavy puzzles, tough decisions, or a challenge of any sort really, then you would likely be disappointed. If you were anticipating strong environmental storytelling, intrigue, and exploration both of characters and the environment, then you'd probably have a good time. Despite not being based primarily around confrontation, usually lacking puzzle elements, and being largely linear affairs, Walking Sims have carved out a nice little niche in the industry. Some of the best stories I've experienced in games have been through this genre. It also allows smaller developers to express ideas in ways that a AAA studio's design ethos wouldn't typically allow. Really, I don't expect the genre to hail in a new storytelling epoch in the medium on a large scale, but I've been elated to see that Walking Sims are finally starting to garner the support I've always thought they deserved. They highlight stories and people as mundane as you or I, and when done right, I think they can be shockingly effective. 